Aaron, what have you done that's cool? Everything you do is cool, remember? Hi everybody, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. How you doing? God, <laughs> stop doing that. That's, that's... Are you coming on to our listeners? Maybe. They're very attractive. This is why we don't have as many listeners as we could. I'm just saying, studies studies are starting to show consistently that Concept Crucible has like the most attractive demographic of listeners. Oh. You are right about those studies that we commissioned. Yeah. I mean, we might have a little bit of a sample bias. Yeah. I mean, but... I, well, but I have read that. Yeah. I mean, I did write that. Yeah. So, yeah, I would have to have read it. Yeah. At the very least, we love all of you, our listening and viewing audience. You being singular. I mean, not not like everyone who listens to this show. Literally you. I'm thinking what we should do is start naming off names and somebody who's listening. It's like, oh my god, they're talking to me. It's like, yeah, I'm talking to you, Mark. I'm talking to you, Helen. This, I'm talking to you, John. Please, <laughs> please stop turning our podcast into Romper Room. <laughs> Right now. Oh my god, he's talking to me. He knows I'm listening right now. <laughs> I hate you so much. Anyway, today's topic is not, in fact, naming every one of our listeners randomly from a baby name book that we found somewhere, but instead, uh, preventative maintenance. Yeah. And what that means to us, and sort of as a way of keeping one's life going. Mm-hmm. And uh, But first... Icebreaker. It has been a month since since Scotland Reflections, since we got back from Scotland. Yep. What is one cool thing that you have done since then? It's been a month. Shape up. So, uh, since coming back, I've had a more time to invest into preparing for my course. So, in case you haven't been following along, or in case I forgot to mention it on camera I don't at some point. you mentioned it. Maybe not. Um, but I've got a new part-time gig lined up for the fall that I will be teaching a philosophy course at uh, the college, the college of which I already work mm. at as a support staff. Um, so I'll be teaching three hours a week. It's a um, you know, general liberal studies course, but it's aimed at philosophy. Uh, so I'm pretty excited because I always made a, a joke that my dream job would be to teach intro Plato, not because I'm a plato file, but uh, I would teach Intro to Plato to college kids the rest of my life, and this is more or less one step away because it's because it's a liberal studies course, and the chair I think has a background in either English lit or critical theory, mm-hmm. so he's super game for like any weird <laughs> presentation um, in order to get the kids excited about. No, no, liberal I arts. need to I need to not wear pants. It's a pedagogical tool. God, I don't know if he'd go for that, but uh, so I've been I've been. I'm still, as of recording, in the kind of marinating phase where I've got a bunch of ideas and I'm not quite sure which one I'm going to stick to, Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm kind of letting everything bubble and simmer and we'll see see what what comes out because um, I really want the first lecture to to set a good tone for the rest of the course. Um, And I don't want to... You know, stand and lecture at the front of the room for three hours. Uh, my inspiration comes from not just instructors that I've had in uh, in my educational experience, but mm-hmm. companies like the Teaching Company, where they get award-winning professors. So whenever they lecture, they're essentially telling a story, mm-hmm. and uh, because they plan out entire courses, you know, twenty-four lectures, um, they are able to embed thematic elements Ooh. that run through the entire course. And I want to do something like that. So right now, um, I'm marrying two kind of similar ideas, but I'm not sure which one I'm going to take right away. Um, I was talking to the chair the other day, and I realized, because the course is called Quest for Wisdom, and, and yeah, like, it is, it, is, it is a straight up college class, right? But because, because inherent there is a quest for meaning and deriving meaning from it and the actual quest motif, you can do a lot of really cool things. Like, for example, you could just straight up steal... Joseph Campbell's Hero of a Thousand Faces and talk about the quest motif. Especially with the way the different subjects are set up. Uh, they do a kind of... Does Heidegger become your journey into the underworld? No, 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 not yet. Nietzsche's in there at one point. Oh. <laughs> uh, but the, the topics are kind of set up in terms of uh, the self and then how the self relates to different elements of the human existence. So the self with disease, death in the self, technology in the self 
community okay. in the self, love in the self. So I, I think just from a kind of base, bare bones level, I'm going to try to set up the students to think about a, a naive conception of the self in the first lecture, and we'll touch on all, on all of these topics on how the self or the conception of the self changes, and then it'll be really interesting from like the, the quest motif to cycle back around to where they came from and compare where their new conception oh. of the self comes from compared to the old one. You know, revisit the place you started from and discover it for the first time. Once you finish your syllabus, you should share it. Uh, actually, I'm not the one generating the syllabus. I am responsible for generating the, the lecture content. Oh, that's, but, that's neat. So but, it's like syllabus roulette. Yeah, so... Except uh, you'll have done a bunch of reading and pre preparation in advance. Yeah, uh, but the other interesting thing is the syllabus is set up in three three large sections. The numinal self, um, the transformative self, and... It's like the imperative self. Did you not read the syllabus, Ryan? I did, but right now my brain's too tired to remember the specific word. Um, but I noticed the way we kind of go through, like, disease, death, tragedy, and whatnot. That's the first little bit of it. I realized that there's a kind of link to Dante going down into mm. hell. And then hanging around hell is other people, if I want to bring in some of the French existentialists. Because the person who wrote the course is definitely a continentalist. Mm. And then you you come back around into paradise in terms of love, community, technology, hope, and whatnot. So that's actually where the Nietzsche part comes in. Was uh, the professor set it up so you know, like Pandora's box, the last thing to come out was hope. And some people read that as being like a good thing that kind of washes away some of the evils of the box. And Nietzsche's like, no, hope is the worst of all possible yeah, yeah. tortures. Well, why was hope in the box in the first place? Yeah. So, so he, that's why he, that's why Nietzsche for some reason is a course outcome. I'm kind of arguing against making Nietzsche a specific course outcome, but, um, so it's an icebreaker. Long story short though, I've got a lot of interesting ideas on how to present the material in, a, in an interesting way. That's not just, all right, here's the syllabus, let's go through it procedurally, but to actually set up several themes that and introduce all of the content of the, uh, the course in the first lecture so that they know what's coming and they're interested in coming back to figure out how it all fits together, and then figure out a way to yeah. fit it all back together with callbacks and so That's what I've been doing since I got back from Scotland. Eat. Uh, what's one cool thing I've done since I got back? Uh, I have been streaming. I have uh, I, I stopped stre streaming Minecraft because I was really just sort of a warm up stream uh, over at uh, Twitch.tv slash JTigwell, which is my personal channel. But uh, yeah, I got sort of uh, I I because we do Minecraft videos on the channel already uh, twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I was using the same mod pack, and I'm like, I don't I don't want to additionally stream. Um, so I was, I was really, when I got, the week I got back, I was like, I gotta stream something. Like, I made this commitment to stream every Tuesday, and I want to stick with it. Because uh, I want to stream more, and it's really fun. I was like, what am I going to stream? And I'm like, going through my games. And I'm like, and uh, Ryan Consul, who we've had on the podcast a bunch of times, uh, leans over to me, and he's like, dude, just scream, stream Skyrim. You're itching to stream Skyrim. You know it, and I know it. Just do it. I've talked about Skyrim on the podcast before. Yep. I did an entire video on it uh, back in April for my Friday Favorites. It's one of my favorite games ever. Uh, and I have a very like peculiar and particular way of playing it. And I have been doing that. As of recording, I've done two Skyrim streams. I'm going to do my third one tomorrow. Um, so I right, tomorrow is Tuesday. Uh -huh. <laughs> you can tune in at 7 p.m to uh, watch me stream Skyrim for like three hours and the second stream I did is where I like I set up like the spreadsheet with the stories and who these people are and sort of we started to I sort of figure out like me and the chat together started to figure out who they are um, we talked about what they what they look like and we made all these different Skyrim characters and uh, they all have like a sort of a look and a feel mm -hmm. And then tomorrow, we're actually going to start progressing in the main quest and picking up some followers. I've got a couple of things planned. And I, I was really worried because, A, it's super dorky. I spent three hours playing with spreadsheets and, like, character creation sliders as we made, like, 12 Skyrim characters. 
<laughs> all in the same world. It's super dorky, but people seem to have a really great time. And then on top of that, uh, like it's been an intensely sort of personal thing for me. Like it's, we talked about it in the Distractions podcast, where I was like, I was worried about Skyrim because I was spending hours and hours telling these stories. I'm telling stories in the wrong place. I'm not telling them in videos. I'm not telling them on my blog. I'm not telling them, you know, in D and D. I'm just these these stories are mine and they're mine alone. Mm. And so I was worried I'd, I'd feel sort of possessive of it. And the, the opposite is true. I'm having a really great time because I get to tell these stories. We've got, you know, a crazy Dragon Ball Z, Dragonborn. We've got a Death Knight. We've got a Warlock. We've got all, kind, all kinds of cool people. <laughs> um, so, yeah, tune into that. And it makes me really happy. It is like... I should have been streaming this all along, and I'm excited to stream this for like the next probably two years. Yeah, I've already got some bonus streams sort of simmering in the background for the weekends. Uh, once we get a little further in the game, mm-hmm. so yeah, it's God, it's it's so dorky. <laughs> but none of that is the topic for today. Today's yeah. topic is preventative maintenance. And yeah. So preventive maintenance is something you usually do on uh, machines or cars or computers, mm-hmm. um, you know, and it's the little the little fixes you do and the little checkups you do to make sure that you don't have to do big fixes, mm-hmm. you know, like oh well this part's about to fail, you know this belt in my car is uh, looking worn, replace the belt that way it doesn't break in half at some point later and mm-hmm. put itself through another part, yep. uh, or flatline my car in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Um, I was once in a car where the uh, timing belt broke. Mm. Snapped, uh, snapped, went through the engine block. Uh, we were in the drive-thru of a Tim Hortons. I bet that pissed off a lot of people. Yes, it yeah. was prime time for that oh. Tim Hortons. Oh, we knew the people who worked there, too, so like we rolled it. And we'd already ordered. So we start pushing the car. And, and we push it up to the window. And, and a friend of ours leans out, and they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, the car's dead. Well, here's your coffee. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's, you're pushing your glorified Keep pushing. cup holder. <laughs> yeah, basically. So, yeah, we, we, we pushed the car out of there. And it, and it, but it's, and it's maintenance prevents things like that. Mm. It can help prevent, mm. prevent things like that. I mean, all these accidents will happen. Right. Yeah, I <clears throat> I first came across this idea. So I, my main job, my nine to fiver, um, has me interacting with industry members in in the engineering fields. Uh, so, I mean, I've always intuitively had a sense of preventative maintenance, um, but it wasn't until we had these you know mechanical engineers sitting around a table mm-hmm. and they're discussing how their plant deals with preventative maintenance. So some organizations value preventative maintenance much more than others um but the problem is is preventative maintenance is it's still investing money into a problem that's not really that big yet yep. um there was a there's a quote that you had from uh babylon 5 i believe yes. uh, or maybe a paraphrase yeah. of a quote um which is which is i use this at work all the time too it's that all all big problems start as small problems they they use sort of they occur, and you water them with your unconcern until they grow too large to deal with. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're looking at a, a fairly large uh, manufacturer, Toyota or whatever, um, you know, you'll do these scheduled shutdowns where, yeah, you're losing money by stopping per, uh, operations. You're spending money on putting in new parts that may or may not be worn out. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but the idea is down the line, you're going to prevent these large catastrophic failures. Um and so when I first was introduced to the topic, I thought that was really interesting. And then I started to reflect on the various things that I do for preventative maintenance. So, I mean, it's little things like, you know, changing the oil in the car. Yep. Like that is preventative maintenance. You could run with the oil, but I mean, eventually the oil is going to get too mucky and it's going to clog up the engine. It affects your fuel economy. So rather than waiting until the last possible minute to change oil, you, you should be doing it uh, much, much earlier than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was my first introduction to it. But then I started thinking about myself, like regular visits to the doctor, to the dentist, yep. 
to a certain degree, uh, exercise becomes preventative maintenance. Absolutely. Um, and I didn't realize that until, so A, when I broke my ankle, and then B, when I started uh, studying biology and I, I found out how uh, bones grow and strengthen and how muscles grow and strengthen. They mm-hmm. only grow and strengthen by you stressing them. Yep. Uh, and so in some sense, in order to prevent further injuries, uh, think about right now as of filming the Olympic, the Olympics are going on. Think about gymnastics uh, and just how strong you have to be to do some of the amazing feats of, of human strength and to, oh, yeah. for that, right? Uh, think of all of the kind of the, the, the training and the dedication that goes into just preparing your legs to land a, a, you know, a vault off of, say, the horse or something like yeah. that, right? Or... Uh, um, any of the floor routines. But anyways, um, and I realized, and I was partially inspired with this topic, Jim, you recently had an issue with preventative maintenance. I So I, I, and I should know better too. I used to do preventative maintenance for a living. Yeah. On uh, growth chambers where we'd go in. Because, I mean, with a, with a growth chamber is like a temperature-controlled environment. And if your thermometer blows out or your light bulbs blow out improperly, you can lose a five-month experiment. Just like that. It sounds like you're talking about a grow up. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Except <laughs> if it was a grow up, it was recurring with some very boring plants in the middle of the University of Toronto and <laughs> University of Guelph and a bunch of other universities and agribusinesses around on, on southern Ontario. Mm. It's a really good job, though. Uh, but no, I I uh, recently was at the dentist where I got a root canal and uh, I got a tooth removed, uh, a tooth that I definitely should have gotten looked at, you know, two years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, or longer, but uh, you know, it was one of those things where I didn't a I didn't have insurance, mm-hmm. uh, which meant not having you know sort of money. Um, but even then, I was just sort of I couldn't be bothered, and the result was, and I and I mentioned this in the dentist's office when they're like, "Is it painful?" I'm like, "It's kind of painful, but this is the the cost of watering this with my unconcern." <laughs> is is I recognize that. This is grown-up pain. Like, this is... I am suffering some discomfort because of a thing that, A, I have neglected, and, B, in order to save myself future discomfort. Yeah. You know, like, it will be worse if I just leave it. Yeah. Yeah, I... I, uh, I went about 10 years uh, between, like, the last dentist visit that I had and the one recently. The only thing that triggered me to go to the dentist was if I thought I had a cavity forming that I could feel... Turns out it was a chip, um, and they're, the dentist is not concerned. But um, I used to go regularly because we, my parents, I, when I went with them, like we had a dedicated dentist mm-hmm. in London, and then I went away to university, and then I didn't travel home nearly as often, so we didn't really schedule dental appointments. And then suddenly, it's ten years later uh, of stacking. You almost feel habits. embarrassed, right? Like like yeah. when you go to the dentist, you're like your dentist. Yeah, I mean your dentist is going to ask you, they're like, "Are you brushing?" And you're like. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, are you flossing? And you're like, yeah, because you lie. Mm -hmm. And, like, I I feel embarrassed. I'm like, brushing your teeth is probably the easiest and most well-known form of, like, human being preventative maintenance. Like, Mm -hmm. like, here's a thing that is universally good for you. It does not take a lot of time or effort. No. And often, you you still, like, you don't do it or you you skimp on it or... Well, there was a long time. Uh, I would say the bulk of grad school for me, I would only brush once a day. I'd brush at night to clear the palate of everything from the day and then, you know, wake up the next morning and just not set aside time or whatever to brush my teeth. Yeah. just pop some gum for the dragon breath mm-hmm. and then go on with my day. Really, it wasn't until, you know, having a serious relationship where she's like, you got to brush your teeth. It's not quite shame, but I, I felt shame. I to talk to you about that on the podcast, yeah. Ryan. Yeah, so... So that, it, and then I finally got some better habits and, uh, I went to the dentist. I had to schedule two visits to the dentist. The first time I went back after 10 years because the hygienist could not finish cleaning the plaque and whatnot in wow. one session. So I had to go back. Uh, but then I've gone back since, so a six month later and thankfully she said, no, nope, whatever you're doing, fl- br- uh, brushing and flossing, keep doing it because it looks good. I'm like, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Achievement unlocked. Achievement unlocked. I'm back on track, sort of. I could probably be doing better, though. Yeah. No, I mean, so preventive maintenance, I think, as a human being is, is, yeah, it's the little things you do that help, they, they, they help you look out for future you. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and not just for future you, I think. Also for future other people. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, in the sense of, like, it's easy to say, well, I'm looking out for, for old me when I exercise or when I brush my teeth. Like, old, old me, older me will suffer less. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm looking out for older me when I do things to maintain relationships. Mm-hmm. Like per- personal relationships, whether it's friendships or romantic relationships or family relationships, you know, or business relationships, whatever, whatever, however you want to compartmentalize that. When I do things that sort of help me build those, what I am doing in 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 perhaps the the one of the coldest senses is preventative maintenance. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that I, I I need to do something in order to um, keep this thing going and to, to, to ensure that this thing lasts. And I think, go ahead. I was just going to say, this might be uh, a topic for a future, maybe we'll get Jackie on the show, but I've been reading a couple books recently that makes reference to the idea of a love bank. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm... I, I, I came to a uh, self-realization that there's no shame in reading books about how to have healthy, good, romantic relationships because I read books on everything else. Yeah, you're like you're the king of how-to books. We understand yeah. that. Why? Why would I not find value in other people's advice on sure. it? And so, a couple of books that I've been reading recently have made reference to the idea of a love bank. Now, the love bank is mostly used when discussing romantic relationships monogamous yeah. relationships but it, it can be applied elsewhere sure but the idea of a love bank can still be in reference to friends in a non-romantic sense and the idea is when you do things together essentially like, it's like a preventative maintenance but when you do things and have shared experiences you put deposit into a love bank and it brings you closer together and when you start to you know defy expectations when you start to renege on things when you spend less time together it starts to take withdrawals from it and the mm. relationship weakens yeah. Um, so if you think about it in that metaphorical way, that's where preventative maintenance of relationships can... There's can probably a really well. interesting compound interest metaphor in there somewhere. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah, that seems really neat. Yeah, I, 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 I occasionally think about it like that just because I need to compartmentalize my time and I'm really bad at it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel the same way. Like if I'm going to like call a friend that I haven't seen in a while to go for coffee um, or like dinner or something first off i as a human being have forgotten how to function in that regard like i don't really know anymore how to sit down with human beings without needing to like have a meeting have an agenda um like like, like where you're like here's some shit we need to do um play D D. like like something is happening I, I don't know how to interact with people anymore i remember sitting in a bar one time uh waiting for a meeting to start and uh, seeing all these other people just sort of having fun and hanging out, and I'm like, "Where are your fucking notepads, you slackers? What's wrong with you?" And I'm like, "No, no, it's me. Oh no!" But I feel that same embarrassment that I feel like going to the dentist, where I'm like, "I haven't been doing what I'm supposed to be doing," and I'm, and again, I'm not. It's not just that I'm supposed to be doing it; it's that I, I want to do it. You just haven't been doing it because, you know, I had other stuff and I feel bad that my other stuff got in the way of this thing that is important. Hmm. Um, the fact that I just equated friendships with brushing my teeth um, probably demonstrates what a trash bag of a human being I am in terms I, of life skills. I think, you, I think you're giving yourself uh, too, much, too much criticism there. I think... I think maintaining relationships and whatnot is a, something you have to practice, something you have to mm-hmm. do. In some sense, it's a habit, perhaps a virtuous habit Fuck that me. you should be doing all the so time. Much. I will win this one. You're not going to um, win this one. However, when we were doing the pre-show, we were also, I started into some of the, you know, I guess, semi-pragmatic concerns about why you might not do this, then you brought up a very valid one, and I think you've already said it in in the podcast. There are some legitimate obstacles to doing preventative maintenance, one of them being cost or insurance, some sort of upfront cost. So when we talk about a business doing it, usually it's something budgeted for or it's something that they have enough capital that they can just do this. Yeah. But when you're a person trying to balance a present budget with the cost of 
fixing, replacing, completely burning to the ground and rebuilding in the future, the present kind of takes priority because it's the thing that I have to live through right now versus yeah, yeah. I, future me. I have problems. to I have to survive yeah. to become future me yeah. in order for future me to benefit from this. And yeah. I think that that is that it goes it goes into a, 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 a large part of it too. It's just that notion that like I'm mortal. Yeah. This all I have to do is die before this becomes a problem. Yeah, you know, or or you know, the, our tendency to sort of mortgage our future to to enrich our present. Mm-hmm. Um, which I think is a tendency of people to do, do sort of individually, but also obviously like as a species, Mm -hmm. we're sort of big on that. Yeah. Well, even, uh, in prepping for my course, I'm reading the textbook and they discuss studies that, uh, in terms of hyperbolic, uh, discounting, um, younger people Mm -hmm. are terrible at it. Older people tend to appreciate it more, probably because they are closer to death Mm -hmm. (laughs) than to, to be perfectly morbid about it. But um, when you're younger and carefree and your body is, you know, of average health or average capability and whatnot, you typically don't think about these things. No, you're like, I will always be like this. Yeah. And, then, and then you start. I have always um, been this way. It will always be this yeah, way. Yeah. And then, and then you get to that point where you like, you're out of breath and all you did was like climb a hill no. or some stairs. Yeah. And you're like, shit. Or uh, me breaking my ankle and yeah. now being acutely aware when I sit in a position for too long, when I try to run, when my mm-hmm. ankle clicks weird, when I have less f- uh, flexion in it. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's an acute reminder that um, uh, I now exist in a post-ankle breaking period and that is going to affect me now, but it might also affect me down the line in terms mm-hmm. of you know arthritis or whatnot. Like, this is a thing. I have metal pins in the bone. That this is going to be something that I have to live with the rest of my life. Um, and so sometimes it's really easy to just, you know, only think about it. I don't have time or whatever. Um, but the cost thing is, is really important. Yeah. And I think there's another element to it, too, uh, as an obstacle. As you get older, so as you move out of your teenage years, out of your college life, uh, out of your early to uh, mid-20s, life becomes really complex and then it becomes really difficult to keep on top of all of these things. It's kind of like life creep. You know, when you make more money and you start doing more things, like you, you know, if you move out of a rental or start to own things, mm-hmm. own cars, pets, children, all... You, you don't you, own children. Well, uh, no, okay, but you are responsible for the well-being yes. of pets and children. Um, but what I'm saying in that regard is um, you have the same amount of time in a day. You know, you still have 24 hours and it's... Uh, unless you're talking relative, relativistically speaking, it's the same amount of time. Mm-hmm. But now you have more things occupying your time. And unless you are very diligent in tracking or staying on top of it, it's very easy for things to slip through the cracks. Or like, oh, I'll do that tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And then suddenly, boom, cavity. I am So I am less favorable toward that um, than, than one might expect. Like, as somebody who, who does a bunch of sort of semi-strict time management and, you know, like, sort of, sort of have my, my job away from job, mm-hmm. um, I, my, my issue with it is, is that, like, I have an understanding that everything I do with my time um, is a thing that I sort of opt into doing. And that would arguably include children. Uh, I do not have any, but in the sense that um, I'm opting, I'm opting into a responsibility that I that, that I understand, and that I understand is going to like take X amount of time, and if I really sort of am able to, I can actually trade dollars to get that time back. Um, if I want it, if I va- if I value other things over. You know that time with kids. Mm-hmm. You know you can hire a babysitter, mm-hmm. um, or daycare, or whatever. And then and so, like how I spend my time. In in many ways, not obviously not in all ways, but in many ways, and with whom I spend my time, is governed by in 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 part by my choices. At the very least, my choices in how I prioritize that time. And so what this means, for example, for, for 
you know, I, I talk about how I'm bad at, at maintaining sort of um, friendships and things like that. I, I, don't, I don't feel like I do my, my, my due diligence um, or that I, that I, you know, meet the obligations that I certainly set for myself with people. And I think I've talked about this on the podcast before. Um, but I do find time to stream every Tuesday. Mm-hmm. You know, like, it's it's not just that there isn't time. It's that, like, these are responsibilities that I've set up for myself because these are the ways in which I am prioritizing time. I am streaming instead of going out with dinner to, with friends to dinner or going to a movie with somebody or, you know, I am editing videos and podcasts instead of, um, you know... Uh, going and hanging out with people or seeing their, you know, their latest theater production. Mm-hmm. I am getting up at five in the morning to write blog posts rather than getting up later and staying out late with people, um, having a good time. Mm-hmm. And, and so like, as much as I'm like, uh, like, like it, I think, I think sort of couching it in the, in the, in the language of responsibility makes it easy to sort of, externalize the choices about priorities that we make and i mean again obviously there are, there are always going to be choices that are not real choices so you know there are days when depression keeps you in bed mm-hmm. that's you're not like choosing to stay in bed you are choosing to exercise self-care mm-hmm. um in whatever whatever means that you can you know if you have physical injuries like obviously it, you know, if there are structural issues, which could include everything from uh, patriarchy to poverty, mm-hmm. that keep you from doing things, mm-hmm. you know, and that can be everything from I can't afford to have a night out, to um, if I go out, I have to like go to this bar that people go to, which is dangerous for me, mm-hmm. you know, like there's a there's a laundry list of things. That, that affect those choices mm-hmm. um, and turn them into non-choices. But I think that in many cases, it's tr- as Donald Trump would say, many cases would support the fact that um, the way that we prioritize the this time is uh, different and it matters and it's it's sort of up to us. Like... We, you and I don't have a lot of time because we have budgeted it at our time to other things. Mm-hmm. You know, we volunteer and, you know, do podcasts and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that, that that's that's part of it. And I think it is, an, like, balancing those can be a huge obstacle. Mm-hmm. I mean, I want to do all the things, mm-hmm. but it turns out there aren't enough hours in the day. Mm-hmm. But when I have to make a choice about those hours... Here I am. <laughs> yeah. Showing up and performing. Mm-hmm. I mean, rather than you and I just being in a bar together, hanging out. Well, that, I mean, to be fair, that's how this all started. Yes. Until we realized that we should put a camera in front of us. or 62 I, episodes ago. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I only conceived of it as an audio-only podcast, but huh? uh, I didn't see the lights. If it's an audio-only podcast, then it's 64 episodes. True. Because um, of uh, the great hard drive crash of 2015. <laughs> but, yeah, I, th- I think that there, there, there are a lot of, of obstacles to doing preventive maintenance that are more... L- less in, less in the, the sort of time that we have and more in the, um, the way that we prioritize that time. I mean, like, like, you look at... Brushing your teeth is always a classic example because it takes so little effort. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not a weighty thing. It's like two minutes. Mm-hmm. You know, brush your teeth for four minutes a day, two minutes in the morning, two minutes at night. You will save yourself so much grief. Mm-hmm. You will, you know... Unless you, unless you overbrush, in which case you cause different kinds of problems. Yes, but, <laughs> you know, let's say that you, you, you brush two, you know, four minutes a day yeah. is like, what, just about 1,500 minutes a year. Mm-hmm. You know, which I'm going to do some quick off the cuff math, um, which is about I don't even know how many hours. God damn it! Um, it's like two and a half or something. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's way more than that. Um, it's 
but the point is is that you take a tiny you should never try to do math like right on the recording i've been lousy at math all night well you could always you could always move your mouth and then edit in edit in (laughs) we're not gonna gonna do that (laughs) um but it is like like it's it's a tiny portion of your life when compared to you know the amount of time you spend doing anything else and it pays off super huge in a way but i think it's also that we don't often notice the benefits of it Mm -hmm. because what we're doing is sort of preventing calamity Mm -hmm. rather than creating like sort of we don't regard creating benefit um and preventing calamity as the same thing no which they are yeah like when you get your car maintained you're preventing calamity Mm -hmm. which creates benefit to you like you know you you do the hundred dollar repair job now so you don't have to do the seven hundred repair job dollar repair job later. Yeah. Um, and when you think about it in money or time, it's really easy to to compartmentalize mm-hmm. like that. Um, but it also seems callous when when talking about you know uh, relationships that we have with other people or with our th- ourselves. We haven't even talked about self care. No. Yeah. Um, which is a huge, I think, part of preventative maintenance is you know like taking care of yourself like mentally and emotionally mm. is i mean things like vacations yeah downtime and- downtime and understanding what downtime means for you yeah is a huge asset uh in you know like keeping you sane day to day so those decisions and the benefits we see from those i think are hard cognitively to weigh against other ones i mean you always see people who are like well I'll skip my vacation and i instead you know i work mm-hmm. and i get i get money and i lose nothing mm-hmm. because i don't understand the value of downtime and then you know three years later i just burn out mm-hmm. and it sucks yeah so yeah i think cognitively we're just shit at it well, in the sense of you know, human beings are we're 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 weak willed. Yeah, we focus on the present. Um, I think how to be better at that has less to do with any particular strategy mm-hmm. than it does with reorganizing our values, mm-hmm. like individually. I mean, let's let's not talk about collectively, like as a species, but no. individually, if we value our well being over other things it starts to sort of put that stuff in perspective yeah i say this as a person who's fucking awful at this yeah you really need to make future jim a real person in your mind and empathize with him he plight. is <laughs> he is i wrote like a series of blog posts about it you can see them in the show notes yeah i wrote all about like my ethical obligations to future jim and i recognize them every day it's literally my job to solve problems for future me um but i do that all day at work and then i come home and i'm like ah, i could eat chips for dinner yeah or ice cream? No, ice cream is because of the dentist. Yeah. Now the ice cream I have after this podcast is because I want ice cream. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of. Preventive maintenance is good for you. Yeah. It's good for everything. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it's um, it's easier to be lazy. It's easier to it's always easier to put it off. But for a while. <clears throat> but yeah, in the end, a little bit of preventative maintenance. You know, what is it a? Uh, pound of prevention yeah and an, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure yeah 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 it's 100 percent. yeah the first the first time you have to foot a major expense because of something that was foreseeable or at least preventable yeah yeah you learn <laughs> um i want to know what we missed please leave in the comments yeah. um i want to know what bits of preventative maintenance we didn't catch or we didn't go in depth enough on because that I think is the other the other bit is you you sort of you don't know what you don't know mm-hmm. to 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 borrow other popular aphorisms, um, but we have these sort of another the known unknowns <clears throat> yeah we, well we 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 everybody's got um, areas of, uh, where where they need to do preventive maintenance that they can't see mm-hmm. um, or that 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 gets less focus or that. You know they don't 
understand the like, like how to do it or the way to do it. Like I spent years just sort of building a vocabulary of self care to like understand how I work and what really constitutes downtime for me and fun for me and how that's maybe different than other people that I know Mm -hmm. and accepting that it is different and that I need to when I'm when I'm doing that like not trying to emulate them but focus on what I actually need Mm -hmm. so I'm really intrigued to see what we missed Mm -hmm. Uh, in the meantime uh, you can find Huck on Twitter and mm-hmm. Instagram oh. at RJ Huckle or R Huckle on Instagram, I believe. Uh, yeah, I very rarely do I yeah. talk about it, but yeah, I think it's R Huckle. Ooh. You can just search for me on Instagram. Yeah. Um, you can also read Huck's blog, which is in the show notes. Mm-hmm. You can read my blog, which is also in the show notes at jimtigwell.com. Follow my streams at twitch.tv or follow me on Twitter at Concept Crucible and tell me how shit Skyrim I am or how weird I'm being because I'm being, I'm going to be super weird in the streams. It's going to be a good time. Uh, you can also see us in person, live. That's right. It's, I guess we should announce it, huh? Yes. We are going to be at Maker Expo in Kitchener-Waterloo mm-hmm. at Kitchener City Hall on September 10th. Yeah. We're going to be there from 9 in the morning or 10 in the morning all the way through uh, to 6 at night mm-hmm. doing an eight-hour podcast extravaganza. Yeah. We're going to be releasing podcasts all day um, on our mysterious new website which uh, I'm going to launch by the end of the month iwutsuriot.com don't go there right now it's currently there's nothing there Mm -hmm. Uh, I just own the domain name Uh, listen test environments are important no for sure (laughs) they solve problems for future us for sure but uh, yes we're going to be releasing podcasts all day we're going to interview some really cool makers and artists and if you stop by you Mm -hmm. I want to talk about your maker moment and the things that you make and the things that you care about. And until then, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And we're signing off. Stay awesome. When you when you do so many cool things that nothing seems cool anymore. <laughs> We've ruined cool for you. Apparently.